district. We will start with you, Laura. I think you're on mute, Laura. <laughs> Shoot. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm Laura Bruce in the first district, and I'm going to be presenting today with um, Ryan. Do you want us to start our whole thing now, or is everybody going to introduce themselves? Um, it's totally up to you. If you would like to um, go ahead and introduce yourself and, and Ryan from the first and go ahead with your presentation, and then when it's time for second, third, and fourth, we'll do the same thing. Okay. Um, sharing capability. Do you Yep, you should be able to. Is that correct, Luke? Let's see. Ryan, are you on? Yep, yep. Okay. I'll get it pulled up here. And yep, you should be able to share. Okay. So I'm Laura, and I'm, uh, I work out of the women's facility in Waterloo. And Ryan is in our Dubuque facility. All right, so we just made a brief little slideshow here. And like Laura said, my name's Ryan Kelly. I'm the community treatment coordinator here over in Dubuque. I'm at the Dubuque Residential Facility here. So we just made a brief little slideshow to kind of highlight some of the um, services that I use here in Dubuque. And I know Laura's got some of hers in Waterloo as well. So I'll just kind of start briefly going through these here. Uh, the first one that I kind of wanted to highlight um, is an agency called Operation Empower, um, mainly their Li Liberty Recovery Center. So this is something new that um, their Liberty Recovery Center is one of the newer things that we have in Dubuque, been around for about a year now. And what that entails is, is it's actually a 24 um, room complex um, for people that can get in-house treatment services there. Um, so I've talked with them and worked with them with some individuals over the past, and they said that it takes about six months to fully get through their program. Um, everything is on site there. Um, so they have a schedule of treatment groups that they do. Everything is done in-house. And then I do know that they actually help some of the residents with um, transportation if they have outside appointments to get to as well. Um, and last I heard, with what they do is they take 30% of the area medium income. So there is actually a um, line there of income somebody can make. Um, most of the time though, that when we get people um, help place there, they're either like coming from jail or don't really have employment going quite yet. So they normally can fall within that income uh, guidelines there. Um, also with Operation Empower, so they actually have two other housing uh, buildings as well, just right down the street from the recovery center, and that's the Salvia and Manassa House. Uh, one's for men, one's for women. Um, and what those kind of entail is they're really just like um, somebody might live there and then they have their own separate bedroom, and it's like a community style living where then they have a shared bathroom or um, shared kitchen area. And recently, something that they've been working on is um, anybody that's staying at the Salvia or Manassa House can also utilize the services at the Liberty Recovery Center as well. And it's super nice. They're right next to each other, only a couple minute walk. Um, and those are actually pretty close to our residential facility as well, downtown Dubuque here. Um, second agency I was just going to highlight is Catholic Charities here in Dubuque. Um, and I know that's, we got Dubuque slash Waterloo up there. There are other areas as well. But we have, um, in Dubuque here, we have a lady named Karen Hogart who works with the jail and prison reentry services. So she works pretty closely with a lot of our folks on probation and parole. A um, couple of the, the two big things that they do are mentoring and their circles of support. Um, so I know I always see Karen down here in our facility meeting with clients. Um, figuring out what they need. And she's actually been doing um, 
some groups here as well for some of those individuals. I know she was doing like a life skills type group here as well. Um, I also see that they have, um, they also have some properties for like affordable housing. Um, and then I got case management counseling services as well. So it's kind of meeting with clients, seeing where they're at, what do they need um, to get things in order. Uh, third one we got is Fountain of Youth. Um, so Caprice Jones is the founder of that program here in Dubuque, and he's been working with us here at Probation Parole for a few years now. Uh, one of the main programs that he has up and running is Partners to Partners in Change. Um, and it kind of has some different areas. Again, it's one of those things where they meet the clients where they're at. What do they need to be successful? Um, so the first three things up there, so we got job readiness, education, and city of Dubuque, economic development. So they can either work with um, getting a client job ready, um, and they actually work with some employers where they kind of go through a few month process with partners in change and then actually get them the skills to get them placed in a job. Um, or if they're seeking further education, um, right across the street from Fountain of Youth, downtown Dubuque, we have NICC, um, the community college here that they can get set up with. And then the city of Dubuque economic development. So I see that they can actually work with the partners in change and then actually end up throughout the process getting a small loan to possibly start their own business. Um, and recently Caprice and other members of his staff had have started going into the jail here in Dubuque County as well. Because I've been seeing that it takes, you know, it's a four to six month process um, to get this going. So they've been going and meeting with people in the jail to get this started. So some things are in order when they get out. Um, and then they also just do a weekly kind of like a support group. They call that Real Talk, where we have like participants from the residential facility go down and participate in that. And that's where they bring like other people from the community in. Um, I know like ones I've heard of, they'll have somebody from like the PACO, one of our credit unions here in Dubuque, come in and talk about saving money or building up credit and just something like that. Um, just an easy group for them to go to and get some of that information. Um, and then this slide here, this is for um, our first district here. This is kind of like our Northeast region. So our other counties like Al McKee, Winnishack, Fayette. Um, and Andy Smith is the community treatment coordinator for up there. But one that he wanted to highlight is the Northeast Iowa Behavioral Health. Um, and they got a couple locations here. And I've actually heard that up there in the residential facility in West Union, Iowa, they actually have somebody that's able to come into the facility um, work with clients and get some of those mental health and substance abuse evaluations completed. So that kind of covers my area. So we'll jump to Laura. Okay, so we have Iowa Workforce Development that comes in and they're in our facility so that they can help people with applications, resumes, um, interviewing skills, things like that. They have access to the computers so that they can check their emails to see if they're getting any job bites. Um, you can go ahead and flip it to the next one, Ryan. So we can go through these kind of quick. Um, and then Pathways is another big one. Um, they offer detox services. They offer inpatient, outpatient, um, extended transitional housing. We've got a men's facility that um, or transitional sober living they've got a 14 bed unit that they also take some of our folks in um, and they also provide mental health services so they are a primary resource for our area and then the center of attention is a newer one for the women and the felicia carter is the one who oversees this and she is predominantly looking for women that are coming out of prison they've had clean sober time they are um, able to follow rules and 
they seem to do better in her transitional housing program. So that is a really awesome resource. I wish we had more like hers. Okay. And then Blackhawk Grundy is our primary mental health. They have people that come in and they see our clients. They help get their meds um, so that we can get them filled quicker, um, make connections with the doctors. And then they also do on-site mental health services in our facilities as needed. And then Hawkeye Community College, I'm super excited about this one because we have, again, representatives that are um, housed in our facilities. They do educational uh, programming for HiSET. They're helping people get tuitions um, set up. They've got the Last Dollar Scholar program that they're assisting getting clients in and edu or career programs, forklift driving, CNC, CNA. Um, just to name a few of them so that they're getting better paying jobs when they get out. And then the biggest resource that the clients are going to have in reentry is the relationship they have with their parole officers, because they've got absolutely every resource available to them. These are just to highlight a few that we have. So thanks for the opportunity to be able to share these. Yes, thank you both very much, Laura and Ryan. A lot of good things going on in uh, your part of the state. We appreciate you sharing today. All right, Ashley Lappy, second district, please. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm Ashley Lappy, and I am the executive officer in the second district. Um, I work out of our Ames office, but cover district rate services. Um, our district covers the north central portion of the state. We have 22 counties that we cover and 21 of those 22 counties are considered rural. So we are challenged sometimes finding resources that will hit all of our clients. Um, <clears throat> we have four main offices and um, just gonna highlight a few of those resources that we use in each of the offices. Um, one of the biggest things that we are a part of, but I will not steal the seventh districts um, time is the tablet program. So we use the tablets um, with the Tech to Connect program and that has uh, increased access to a lot of resources for all of our clients. So they will explain more in the next session um, about some of those services. So, um, so I'll start with our Fort Dodge office. So our Fort Dodge office, some of the highlights there is we have somebody from Berry Hill Integrated Health Homes that is in our building. Um, Liz is instrumental in helping our clients getting hooked up with mental health services, medication appointments, getting transportation, signing up for medical benefits. Um, it's been a really big barrier breakdown having her right there in the building. Um, in Fort Dodge, we have our probation office and our residential facility in the same building. So she's able to help all of our clients that come into that office. Um, we also partnered up with APHIS and they help us with some um, mentoring. They give our clients um, an outlet to go play basketball. They help with housing and employment. They've been an amazing asset um, with our residential clients and some of the other um, returning citizens that we have. Um, and again, the Tech to Connect program, we are working from the Fort Dodge Residential Facility, um, reaching into the prisons and being able to start that transition process um, starting to identify employment opportunities, um, completing community treatment assessments, which helps identify needs for when they do return to the community, um, what interventions we can get them set up with once they're here and being able to kind of hit the ground running when they get here, instead of taking the time to have to figure all that out. Um, they can just get rolling when they get here. Um, up in Mason City, <clears throat> we have a rural outreach program that we work with through Mercy and they've helped with assisting the cost of covering some medications. Um, YSS has been willing to see our clients in a timely manner, which I know is tricky for everybody right now, um, getting mental health and medical appointments. Um, 43 North Iowa is helpful with finding housing and employment opportunities. Um, and similarly, wraparound services that we've gotten from Prairie Ridge and their ACT program which is a sort of community treatment program. Um, they help provide medication services, um, daily living tasks, and just kind of provide a holistic um, 
support for clients, and that is through Prairie Ridge. They've also provided some grant funding to assist with housing transportation. Uh, friends, and the friends of the Family and Crisis Intervention Services will help some of our clients with housing costs who are not only clients of ours, but also have their own victimization issues. Um, and then uh, coordination services through CICS help specifically with some of our clients on sex offenses and with mental health issues to find some appropriate housing. Since again, it's a tricky population to, to house. Marshalltown, we work really closely with Satusi, who is a substance abuse provider. Um, we also work with Center Associates and they provide a lot of medication management and mental health services. YSS, um, again, provides both of those services for us, mental health, substance abuse, and medication management. Um, and we work closely with workforce development as well. And then finally, our AIMS office. Um, some of our AIMS resources are limited to Story County just because it is a fairly populous county in our district, in our area. But we have some housing options that include the Matthew 25 House. Um, they are a faith-based program, but they will assist men um, integrating into a local church and then also into the community. Um, the Butterfly House will assist women who are incarcerated with some housing options and they too are a faith-based program. Good Neighbors is an emergency assistance program for Story County residents um, and they offer encouragement and support um, for those that are in need. Uh, Romero House is a transitional living place for those who are homeless, incarcerated, or somebody who just has some unstable or inadequate housing. Um, they do not charge rent and they offer free community meals on Saturdays. They too are a faith-based program. And then two of the big uh, substance abuse and mental health providers in the area are community and family resources and youth and shelter services. So kind of in a nutshell, some of the partnerships that we have up here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ashley. I, I, I appreciate you uh, allowing the seventh district to uh, present on the Tech to Connect uh, program, but I do wanna give the second district a huge kudos. They really started working uh, with tablets uh, long before uh, the rest of us did and, and already had a really good system set up so these tablets are APDS, and Ashley, I think it's the American Prison, Prison Data Systems. Okay. Yeah. So these tablets are through APDS, and that's all I'm going to say because we'll let Kendra <laughs> get more. But a huge, huge shout out to the second district um, for being our leaders in that program and always being so helpful for all of us uh, as we were, you know, uh, helping that program come along, especially into the prison. So thank you very much. Thank you. That's definitely Amanda's brainchild and she has provided amazing guidance for that. So let's go to her. Very good. Thank you. All right. Third district, please. Hi, sorry, I'm struggling to get my screen. Can you help me? I don't know why it didn't share. She's sharing it right now. She is? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So how do I, oh God. So Cash, I'm, I'm unmuted, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We, okay. we can hear you and we can see your presentation. Okay, great. Hey everybody. <laughs> um, so let me see here. So first we have, um, I'm Cash Utesh and I'm a community treatment coordinator with the third judicial district. We cover the, um, we cover 16 counties in the Northwest um, portion of, of Iowa. And so I just wanna highlight a few of the things we do here in the third um, to help people or assist them with reentry. So, if we'll go to the next slide. So the first thing we do is a lot of times conversations will start to happen before somebody is even um, released from prison. And so we wanna know 
where they're wanting to work, where they're wanting to live, um, where they're wanting to go for treatment and substance abuse if that's necessary or needed. Um, and then also we want people to have a plan A and a plan B. And a lot of times with um, reentry, sometimes people will want to go to work release instead where they can save money and then get an apartment on their own. So that is also something that, that we assist with and we provide here in the third. Um, Another way that people get assistance with housing is sober living homes. If they're not quite ready to go out into the community and be on their own, they can go into a sober living environment that is that is really helpful. Um, and I have two, I just have two of the houses highlighted here on, on the slide. You guys can see the slide, right? Okay, I have, I have Hope Street and Prosperity House um, highlighted there. And then another area that we um, assist with is transportation. And so with um, some of the reentry funds that we've had, we've, we've purchased um, bus tickets. And so if we have a client that is struggling to get to a job interview or um, they need assistance getting to their job that they just got like for a few days, we can, we can hand them bus passes. Um, another area that we assist with is we, we, with reentry funds, we've got a care closet. So if if people don't have some of those basic need items like hygiene, um, we can give them a bag full of toothpaste, toothbrush, um, soap, lotion, shampoo, conditioner, deodorant, all of those types of things. And then a, another way that we try to encourage our clients is, is through incentives. And so a lot of times we'll have people that will donate things, whether that be pool passes, um, county fair tickets. Um, we have an indoor football league here in Sioux City. And so we've had some, some football passes donated to us as well. And so if clients doing really well, we'll be like, hey, good job. Here's a pool pass for you and your kids, or here's a pass to the launch pad for you and your family to go to. Um, and it, it's, it's really, it seems to be impactful and our clients seem to really, really appreciate that. Um, another thing that we do here um, in the third is we um, have a Fair Chances Employment Fair, which is, um, which is put on for, um, for our clients and any employer in our area that hires people with a criminal history is welcome to come. And it just creates a um, open dialogue. A lot of times I think our clients um, think that there's the stigma, well, I'm a felon, nobody will hire me. Well, we're finding that's not really the case. Also, some more work that we've done here in the third is we've gone to speak at Iowa Works and the Chamber of Commerce to advocate for why it's great to hire second chance citizens um, and inform them about some of the benefits to hiring people with criminal histories, such as the federal bonding program and the tax credit. Um, so, and also some of the internal interventions that we offer here, we offer ACT Intentional Living, ACT Anger. We have drug court and veterans court. We actually started um, another drug court. We, we have one in Woodbury, Plymouth, and then now in Clay and Dickinson. Um, we, we offer sex offender treatment programming with primary and aftercare. Um, the WARN meeting, which is a welcome and resource notification meeting um, that is put on by the Federal Prosecution Office. Um, that's held here and has been extremely helpful for our clients. And then recently, I have it highlighted here, um, we started a, we have a crime victim impact emotional hygiene class through the Community Justice Center out of Lincoln, Nebraska. And so that's something we haven't had an empathy class for a while here. And so that was a area that had a gap that needed filled. And we were approached by Roscoe Wallace, who is a facilitator of the um, of this class. And he offered to come and do it here. I went and sat in on it. It's great. Um, it's, it's a brief restorative justice intervention. And um, one thing that the clients have said is it's not just somebody um, who doesn't understand that's talking. The unique thing with this class is that it's um, it's people that have been in the criminal justice system. It's people that have been involved in it. And so it's, it's people that understand. And then the last part that I just wanna highlight is our community partnerships. 
So building partnerships with the agencies and the stakeholders in the communities that we serve is really, really important to us. And it benefits our clients by helping us know what's available so we can get them connected to it. And so that's just something that we really, um, we really, really like to be um, involved in. You can see here, I have a, I have a lot of pictures. I have Anthony Thomas, um, who's a probation officer here. He's holding those football tickets that um, were donated as an incentive. We have um, people at Unity in the Community, which is an annual block party put on by, um, by Unity in the Community. And they're an agency that promotes community policing and pro-social and positive relationships with local law enforcement in the community. And so, um, and then the lower left-hand quadrant, we have Trisha Etringer and, Tri and Jessica Lopez-Walker. Um, Trisha is with the Great Plains Action Society and has come to our department on several occasions to educate us and give us training on Native American culture. And then we have um, Semhar Gidebrecken, who is going to be speaking tomorrow up in the left-hand corner. She recently came to our department and um, did a diversity mapping and inclusion exclusion exercise. And so all, we feel like all of these things that we're doing help us assist our clients to um, have a smooth transition into the community. And then the last slide we have, um, all of the reentry coordinators, we have myself, Sarah Anderson, Zach Wolf, and Dan Foote. So if you need assistance with reentry and need to contact someone, you can contact any one of us. Thank you. And thank you very much. Um, you, you are doing a lot, small but mighty uh, district. You're doing a lot of really good things. I appreciate um, that you have people coming in uh, and discussing uh, the Native American population. I believe you serve a, a quite a large population. And so that is just awesome that you're developing those relationships with them. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. All right, we are doing very well with time. Again, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. Um, and last but certainly not least, 4th District, Jen Foltz. Good afternoon. Um, I just put our website in the chat because I don't have a PowerPoint. Um, so we are the 4th Judicial District. We um, have nine counties in Southwest Iowa, um, Audubon, Cass, Fremont, Harrison, Mills, Montgomery, Page, Pottawatomie, and Shelby in alphabetical order. Um, I think we're one of the smallest districts um, geographically um, and staff wise. We supervise around 3,000 people in Southwest Iowa. Um, we have two work release facilities in Council Bluffs. One houses men and women, and the other facility houses the sex offenders and OWI offenders and is a treatment-based facility. Um, and then we have probation offices throughout our district in different um, towns, Missouri Valley, um, Sydney, Florinda, Atlantic, et cetera. Um, we work with a faith-based program called Remnant. They um, provide um, housing, programming, mentorship, um, budget classes um, for folks leaving prison. Um, and so that's been a really great addition to our reentry repertoire in the fourth district. Um, and they're having great success. Um, another agency that we work with is the Human Service Advisory Council. Um, it's a collaboration of about 50 to 75 nonprofit agencies and government agencies that kind of work together, meet monthly and share resources. And every week they send out an email with all the agencies, fundraisers and free events they have. Um, and the probation officers can share this with their, with their clients, um, food pantries, clothing drives, um, free tax help, um, stuff like that. Um, other things that the Human Service Advisory Council does is provide learning opportunities for offenders. So um, the transportation committee folks 
we'll do like a bus riding, learn, learn to ride the bus program. And they'll ride the bus, literally ride the bus route with people and kind of help them navigate that. Um, <clears throat> also, they do an oil change clinic where you learn to change oil in a car. Some folks haven't ever had to do that. Um, I have not attended that. Um, and so anyway, that's a great, uh, great resources throughout the Council Bluffs area. Um, I would say that eight of our nine counties are considered rural. So we definitely have barriers in a lot of our counties. Um, folks usually have to come to Council Bluffs for um, most things. Um, and then Council Bluffs has the unique situation of being across the river from Omaha, Nebraska. So we have access to the resources over there. But again, a lot of barriers for our rural folks. Um, so yeah, and so we have a community health center just down the street, about a block from our residential facilities. They offer uh, medical, dental, medication, all at, like one-stop shop. So that's good. Um, uh, we're also participating in the forklift training. Um, and we have a transitional house here in Council Bluffs. The purpose of the transitional house is for folks to live after leaving incarceration while they await getting their disability benefits reinstated. So we purchased a private residence on our property um, and have used it since about 2014 as a transitional house space for people to live since um, they can't get their benefits back if they go to work release, excuse me, work release. So the transitional house has been good. Um, unfortunately, it's just for males. Um, and the remnant program also now is just for males. So female housing, um, is kind of lacking. Um, we work a lot with Catholic charities. Uh, we have the circle support in Council Bluffs. Um, a lot of the same programming. We do our mental health with Heartland Family Service, Family Access Center. We have the Pathways Behavioral Health Services. Um, we have a drug court a veterans court, a mental health court, um, and we do sex offender programming and domestic abuse programming here. So that's a quick and dirty summary of the fourth district. And thank you, Jen. Like I said, with the third, I, I didn't realize until looking uh, at a map that how small the fourth is. And you talk about small yet fierce and mighty. That is our fourth district. Um, they, you all have been very progressive. Um, I can't believe that the transition house is already nine years old. Mm -hmm. I don't know where that time went. I do not know where the time went. So thank yeah. you very much for the work that you do and for being with us today. Yeah, thank you. So folks, um, our next presentation begins at, I think, three o'clock. So does anyone have any questions for our speakers um, at this time? If something comes up in our next breakout session uh, for districts one through four, you can feel free to put it in the chat and, and we will provide answers for you. Um, Katrina? Yes. One thing I forgot to mention is that um, the work release facility provides clothing vouchers um, and bus vouchers. So when they leave prison and arrive here and have nothing, they can go get something. That's awesome. Thank you. And I appreciate the districts too that um, will actually go and learn how to ride uh, the bus. Um, at our central office, um, we have talked about it in the past. Uh, Des Moines has quite uh, a bus system and there are some of us um, who, uh, okay, I don't know how to use it. And so I have even thought of uh, taking the interns. We have two women right now that work with us um, in central office and they're in our minimum live out at the um, Iowa Correctional Institution for Women. So I'm like, maybe we should all learn how to ride the bus together. Um, I think it could help. And I think too, 
all of these great uh, partnerships and collaborations and everything that you've heard of from the district so far, when they are involved so much with their communities as they are because they live there, but when they can introduce support systems to the individuals on the caseloads, the residents in the residential facilities, it takes away a, a lot of that stigma, as we heard before. Um, it takes away a lot of the shame. It, it shows them people that are there on their side and will walk with them. And so uh, first through fourth districts, thank you so much. You, you cover a lot of territory in our state and you do a lot of really, really beautiful work and, and we appreciate you all very much for that. So I don't see any other questions, so we can take a break and come back at three o'clock for districts five through eight. Thank you. All right, everyone, welcome back. It is three o'clock and we will get started. Um, if you were with us last time, it will be the very same. This session will be spotlighting our community-based corrections, judicial districts five through eight. And so um, first up is Carly Millsap with the fifth judicial district. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Step one, good. Um, I don't have any handouts for anyone, but what I can say is that if uh, there's any information that I go over today that you want, I can email it to you, no problem. Um, I have a lot of attachments and in this information um, and handouts. So uh, my name is Carly Millsap. I'm a probation parole supervisor with the fifth district. Um, I'm also the reentry coordinator. I also work with a few other folks um, in our district. Cameron Gowdy, you may know, she's the Fresh Start residential manager and handles a lot of the um, female reentry work, especially with ICIW. Um, and then Robin Merck and Darren Hutchinson are uh, region supervisors and they cover the Adel, Tumla, Preston, Sheraton, Knoxville, and Newton offices. Um, I work closely with about 13 sober living houses in Des Moines, um, not to go over each and every one of them, um, but a few of the frequent flyers are, are Kingdom Living, Honest Journeys, Dads with a Purpose, Recovery in Action, um, Harbor of Hope, Harvest Academy is one that we use that has a longer uh, program. Um, I stopped and thought I would just highlight a few of the places that we use often. And the first one that popped out to me was Kingdom Living. Um, and Kingdom Living actually has 11 men's houses here just in the Des Moines area, and they have one female house. Um, they are opening a new recovery center in Des Moines. They have an open house starting um, in the middle of May. And I have that information if you're interested in attending. And anybody that knows Jesse Goodwin or has worked with Kingdom Living um, knows the hard work that he's done over the past 15 years or so um, to get this program moving forward. And he's very excited about the reentry center opening. And they're going to do a lot of community work and they'll have a lot of meetings there. And it's not just centered around people that attend Kingdom Living Houses. It's open to everyone in Des Moines that needs help. Um, and that's open to an A and A program. We also have longer term house and housing programs such as Salvation Army and Door Faith that we use frequently. Um, these are in-house treatment and they um, are work programs as well. And they typically last from anywhere from six months to nine months. The employment services that we use in Des Moines um, and surrounding counties include Iowa Works. Uh, we have nine temp services that we work with frequently. Um, they tend to hook us up and it, and it seems like the, the employment opportunities for people on supervision in Des Moines at least um, are ticking upwards. Uh, we have places like um, Osceola Foods who is hiring as often as we can give them um, folks and they provide ride sharing. And so we have several um, businesses that we work with um, in the area and that are um, on the outskirts in other region areas that provide ride services that um, are great opportunities for our guys to work and ladies to work at. Um, 
a few of the places that we use um, that are huge advocates for reentry and for employment. The guys that we work with in the fifth are Evan K, Evelyn K. Davis. St. Vincent de Paul and Randy has been on um, frequently discussing things, and we are so thankful for her and the work that she does in Des Moines surrounding counties. Um, we have some wraparound services of places that I've already mentioned. Um, Evelyn K. Davis does employment, but they also offer uh, assistance with mentoring, um, mostly male clients. They have technical training opportunities for people, and they also have clothing closets, and they do a lot of fantastic work surrounding um, employment assistance, uh, interviewing skills, uh, the clothing closet. They also have a part of it that focuses on professional attire. St. Vincent de Paul um, offers food pantry, clothing vouchers, uh, educational services, license reinstatement programs, and the list kind of goes on and on with St. Vincent de Paul and the services they offer. Oftentimes, um, after we do a parole or probation and take care of my office, um, that's the first stop that they'll go to is St. Vincent de Paul or Evelyn K. Davis. There's also a food pantry that's about um, three blocks away from my office, um, but a longer drive for other folks. Uh, that's called DMARC that opened in the past year that we refer clients to often. We have multiple locations for services, uh, including mental health and substance abuse. I have lists for both of those if anyone is in need of them. Um, a few of the frequently used uh, mental health services are early ball. Broadlands Hospital, Optima, and then we also have jail diversion services, which offer support, transportation to and from appointments um, and counseling appointments, mental health appointments, and then med management assistance. Um, and I, I guess um, the one piece that I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about was just, and I'm sure that like all the districts, and I know Katrina, you understand the amount of um, work and time that goes into just being in the field and being present um, and the just putting down the phone often and having those in-person meetings with people and getting to know um, them in the community. It's not always easy and it's very labor intensive, but it's so worth it. And it's such a rewarding thing to have um, as a part of your job duties. Um, I often have um, the people I supervise, the probation pro officers, um, they come with me and we do meetings um, in the community. And then we often have people come to our staff meetings and it's, it's great to get to know them and work with them. And I'm just very, very blessed with the opportunities we have in Des Moines and within the 5th District. That's it. <laughs> That's all I have. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Carly. Randy, did you see that question there? You're muted, Randy. Did I have a question? No, no a question came in for you. Um, do you partner with Central Iowa Shelter and Services? Uh, we, um, we do at times partner with them. Um, we have more folks that come for VA services. Um, the struggles we have at times are when they're sent to the shelter and there's really small limitations on the amount of days that they can spend there. Um, and the services for just Joe public that maybe doesn't have the, the veterans tie. Um, I can tell you um, in a few weeks, we're going there and doing a staff meeting um, to discuss what opportunities they have to work with our clients. And so I know that sounds like a really great answer, but we're trying to um, strengthen our, our relationship with them and, and also understand that the obstacles that they have being you know, a shelter and the services and what they have as far as um, resources. So. Yes, we do use them. Um, we do uh, kind of tend to focus on um, other places that have a little bit more stability and opportunity for um, a more lengthy stay and treatment services for folks. Yeah. That's a non-answer mm -hmm. for you. Very accurate. All right, any other questions for Carly with the fifth district? And the fifth is um, the district that receives the most people exiting prison. Um, and Carly, I think you, do you have 22 counties or 16 counties? 15. 15, okay. It feels like 30. Yeah, <laughs> yes. It's, it's a busy district for sure. All right, well, thank you, Carly. And again, if you have any questions for the 5th Judicial District, go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, next up is our 6th Judicial District, 
and we have Eric and Lindsay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I don't know if you can see me. There I am. Okay. Um, Eric is not here. He had to leave for an appointment. Um, I think Alicia is going to be on with us too. She's from Johnson County. Yes. There she is. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. So I can go ahead and start here real quick. Um, we are the sixth district. So we have six counties that we cover. We're Jones, Iowa, Benton, Johnson, Lynn, and Tama. Um, we have four facilities here for residential, and uh, we have some satellite offices out in Jones County, of course, Jones and um, Tama. Um, I'm just going to start with a little bit of the Cedar Rapids area. So if we have somebody coming out of prison, um, sometimes they choose to go through Safe Place, which is a sober living residence for males over the age of 18 that have alcohol or drug addiction. Um, they have to have a history of substance use, be in early recovery and criminal uh, substance related charges and criminal history because they do um, require you for the two, first two weeks to, to be uh, heavily committed to the treatment part before you start a job. Um, you do have to pay rent there as well. Sometimes a lot of the confusion is that people just hear of safe place here and so they try to get out of prison and say, um, Oh, I'm going to go to safe place and they have no history of substance use or not a no criminal history of that and they just assume that they can go there and it's just a place to stay. So they have to call and do a pre pre screening interview with um, Ross and Kyle I believe is who it is there and the pre interview does not necessarily mean that they are approved to live there so um, they have. Um, they have vetting purposes that they go through. Um, it's usually a six to 12 month program and it gets them connected with their treatment community and get you set up for a job, how to budget your money. And then they utilize like outside resources for AA and NA. We also have Hope CDA, which is a sober, sober living home for males, but it's faith-based. It's up to a year long. And again, that has a pre-screening process. Um, Sorry, I got thrown off track. <laughs> um, Hope CDA provides job training programs and on the job training. So they have landscaping businesses, they have construction, it provides job skills. And the whole purpose of that is to get men to um, become more uh, engaged in the community, their neighborhoods, their families again, and to be self-sufficient financially and spiritually. Uh, we also have Fresh Start Ministries and the RISE program. The RISE program, um, it, it, Fresh Start Ministries, it begins in the jail um, and in the prisons. And then when they come out, um, we have their RISE program uh, right here on our parking lot in the Cedar Rapids area of our residential facilities. So this is a secular program, it's not faith-based, um, and it helps people with finding a job, housing. One of the greatest things that I've learned that they do is help people get their birth certificates that are needed for maybe their um, IDs. Um, they also offer necessities like deodorant, um, hygiene it, items. They also offer vouchers for shoes, boots, for employment. Um, they can look for jobs while they're there. We also have the circle of support like others have mentioned. Um, Living Beyond the Bars is a nonprofit organization and it offers supports to families and friends of people who are incarcerated. Um, and it offers re-entry assistance through workshops and statewide re-entry resource guides. Um, they do not charge for any of their services. Sue Hutchins also is the one that does a support group facilitation. She works closely with our CRUSH program, which is the community-based uh, or community treatment, AA support groups, things like that. We also have the Willis Dady Shelter, um, which I think some people have already talked about with the Frontier um, jobs, is they offer shelter, housing, hot meals, food pantries, clothing closets, financial assistance, um, we also have our onset high set and GED when available um, through Kirkwood. 
We utilize Iowa Workforce. We also have the WARN program. Uh, we have CAB, Community Accountability Board, um, which offers a bunch of resources, um, people representing our different um, treatment resources around the city. And they sit with our client for probation and parole, and they sit with them if they have um, any issues, struggles with mental health or navigating how to fill out paperwork or what they need to do uh, to get through our system. Um, we offer cognitive behavioral classes. And we also have his hands free clinic where if somebody is coming out of prison and maybe they had medication, but they um, are running out of refills and they can't get in to see a doctor um, within that amount of time, his hands free clinic may have some there to get them through or they can help process um, getting a med refill. Um, getting a med refill until they actually get in to see their doctor. So we have a ton of resources, but that's just uh, one of the, the main connections that we use. Okay. I'm our Johnson County staff. So I'm Alicia Case. I'm a PO down in our Johnson County office, primarily out of Coralville. Um, like Lindsay mentioned, we've got several halfway houses. We have one in Johnson County, um, Hope House. Uh, we do have Kirkwood that comes on site because our field office and the Hope House are connected in the same building. Uh, Kirkwood does come to our office and they offer services not only to the residential clients, but also to the field clients to help them work uh, towards their high set GED or certification programs. Um, we've had several programs, um, forklift programs, and we also have uh, the VA program here in Iowa City. We have the University of Iowa Hospitals is a huge care for us. Uh, specifically with mental health and substance use. Uh, they do have a chemical dependency clinic, which offers several services, including a dual diagnosis, partial hospitalization program, uh, where people will attend Monday through Friday, and it addresses um, people that have ongoing mental health and addiction issues. Uh, they also offer outpatient um, treatment services and counseling. We also have um, community and family resources, which was formerly Prelude, also formerly Mecca, uh, it's known as a lot of names now, community resources. Uh, they also do, do uh, treatment services as well as some limited mental health services. They also offer inpatient uh, treatment specifically for substance abuse, and they have a transitional housing program to involved in their transitional housing program, you do have to be engaged with their substance abuse treatment services. Um, and I believe that transitional housing program, you can stay there for up to two years, as long as you're engaged in their programming. We have Inside Out Reentry is huge down here in Johnson County. They're hooked up with the halfway house, as well as the um, field clients. They come to the halfway house to do weekly meetings. They do weekly community meetings. Uh, they are used as a drop-in um, resource center in the community that people can stop by kind of whenever um, they've got internet access. They can help with resumes. They help with housing applications. They're really a one-stop shop. They will help you with just about anything. They will do individual meetings with you if you're just having a crisis, need someone to talk to. Um, they are invaluable. I refer a lot of people there um, just because they are so open and willing to work with people. Uh, we also have Successful Living is one of our biggest housing providers, uh, specifically with individuals that have disabilities. They offer different um, ranges of housing services, have homes where, you know, they're staffed up to nine hours a day, and then there's um, Options that are less staffed for those that are more independent. Um, same thing with that. I mean, if they have to be engaged in the services, typically they get funding through the state to um, engage in those services, but they'll help take them to appointments, um, work on things with them. Other than that, I mean, I know we have a bunch of other services, but those are kind of the big ones that we utilize most. Uh, any questions, feel free to message me. And I and contact information for some of those. 
Alicia, we do have one question um, from Terry. Uh, actually, I have two questions. It's a safe place question. Uh, he just completed an interview with an individual and they asked how long he's been sober. And the individual said 18 months. He's been incarcerated for 18 months. However, he has a long history of substance abuse. They basically said he didn't qualify because he has been sober too long. Have you dealt with that type of situation before? I'm going to let Lindsay handle that one because she takes places up in our Lynn County office. So I think she's got more experience with them. Perfect. Yeah, and hopefully you can hear me. My camera is not working mm -hmm. now. Um, yes, we have run into that issue um, because it is a sober living living environment and they expect a lot of treatment. It is very structured and scheduled. And actually we run into the same kind of issue if somebody's in jail. Um, we have a hard time getting them into inpatient because they've been uh, sober for longer than 30 days. So unfortunately it is something that we do run into and um, I don't really know of a great solution to that, but because, because they have been sober that long, they're trying to take those that are most uh, in urgent need, I'm guessing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we do have another question. Uh, do the female housing locations accept transgender females? So for the successful living, placements. I don't know how they handle those, but again, those are um, individuals that have disabilities. So if there's no disabilities, I don't know that they would qualify for placement there. Um, other than that, I'm not sure about our, the transgender issues with housing. Mm -hmm. All right, I don't see any no other questions coming in uh, for you folks. Um, oh, wait, we did have another one. I had HOPE, H-O-P-E, C-D-A, accept a sex offender client with mental health, health issues and just received his two-year clean coin. Yay. That's awesome. awesome. That's super awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Judy. All right, Lindsay and Alicia, thank you so much. Alicia, thank you for your flexibility and jumping on with us. We, we certainly appreciate the both of you, so thank you. Um, next up is um, Kendrick from our seventh judicial district. Kendrick, it's all yours. We got you, you gotta unmute. <laughs> I start running my mouth before I can unmute the button. <laughs> so good afternoon, everybody. Again, my name is Kendrick Howard, and I am a uh, supervisor, one of four su field supervisors here in the seven. Um, we supervise uh, seven counties, which is Scott, Clinton, Muscatine, Cedar, and Jackson County. So reentry is what we've been doing for almost 50 years here in the seven. And with the addition of Tech to Connect and this amazing collaboration we have with the seven prisons that we are working with, and with American prison data systems, we're doing reentry better than we've ever done it before. We have CTCs, with which are community treatment coordinators, completing comprehensive treatment assessments, pre-prison release, then developing action plans based on the assessment results. Since we have implemented these assessments to drive our specific individualized treatment plans, we have discovered these assessments provide an opportunity to openly engage in conversation with clients about the results and how we can connect them to suitable resources. This has enabled us to begin working on needs and setting appointments again at the pre-release stage via tablet programming and virtual meetings with POs and other community partners. The rapport building begins immediately and incarcerated individuals have plenty of need focused materials and interactions with, with community resources. So they are not just doing their time, but utilizing their time productively and centered on release and reentry goals. They are offered mental health evaluations, substance abuse interventions, skill building, motivational messaging, virtual group participation, community memberships, uh, mentorships employment and housing resources, all while in prison with the continuity of these services and relationships in the community. 
Another focus for the seventh is in reviving the use of reconsideration of sentences. We believe by serving shorter prison terms, this will help overcrowding issues as well as deter younger clients from embracing a criminal lifestyle or culture. We have extensive involvement with our local judges and county attorneys who are all on board in support of this previously underutilized options. We reach out to clients to begin the reentry process as soon as they arrive at the reception in prison. Again, our focus is for them to get comfortable with incarceration, but to stay focused on what they need to do to be successful back in the community. Providing evidence-based programming from their prison cells to their living room. And, and in the seven, we know this is just not a program, but it's, it's a process. Since clients request to continue the tablet programming after release, the use of the tablets continue in the community at both residential and field supervision. It's the way we do business every day now here in the seven, and we start as soon as possible and we never let up. Uh, lastly, I would like to uh, share that in one of our counties in the seven, we have collaborated with the county sheriff's department and board of supervisors there and open a community resource center at the courthouse. This is centered, this center is staffed full time by a seventh community program monitor and volunteers. We make referrals to mental health, uh, physical health, substance abuse treatment, and help with housing and shelter options, medication, assessing benefits, employment, transportation, computer, um, and phone issues, also general support, mail reception, mobile crisis referral, hygiene products, whatever is needed. We have served on an average of 50 community members monthly since it opened and survey results report 100% would recommend to friends and families. Um, so you wanna know why technology? Well, technology is to provide a connection for justice involved individuals in seven institutions that we're in, in our, and our community. We want to enhance current prison programming and provide additional needs-based resources. We want to offer evidence-based programming from, again, from their cell to their living room. And we want to allow the face-to-face -face skill building with the probation parole officers or community program monitors so they can teach, model, and practice these new skills. And finally, we want to establish trust and start building a relationship. This is crucial to the impact we can have on our clients. With technology, we're able to create a relationship with the click of a button, and we're also able to start building connection much sooner than ever before. So thank you again, uh, Katrina, and everyone for giving the seventh opportunity to share um, what we are doing here in our district. Our employees are proud of what we do, and we believe we're making positive changes in our communities. So thank you. And thank you so much. And just in case um, the second and the sixth and the seventh didn't see, but Chris Wilson, who authored the book, The Master Plan, is actually our keynote speaker tomorrow. The Master Plan is one of the programs that are downloaded, uploaded, embedded, I don't know the word, um, into the APDS tablets. And the master plan has been uh, very well received by the clients um, and individuals. And so uh, we're excited to, you know, we open it up with Director Skinner talking about recidivism and protective factors. Um, with the highlights of everyone who has presented today from employers uh, to 211. And now with this spotlight on our districts, it really shows how all of us are helping to mitigate risk by increasing those protective factors. So Kendrick, thank you so much for presenting. We appreciate your insight. We appreciate you being with us today. Oh, thank you. You guys got any questions dealing with Tech to Connect, please reach out to anybody in the second or the seventh that we'll gladly help you out. Very good. Thank you. And certainly not last, maybe last but not least, is Lindsay Epperson from the 8th Judicial District. Lindsay. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. That's a tough act to follow. Um, <laughs> The tablets aren't working right now for us, but we're going to get there. Yes, <laughs> so um, I'm Lindsay Epperson. I'm a community treatment coordinator at the 8th Judicial District. Um, I'm housed in the Otomo Residential Facility. 
So as I'm looking at my notes here, I'm going to give you guys a disclaimer that this is going to be a very heavy Ottumwa side of the district presentation, just because that's where I'm located. Um, we are a very rural southeast Iowa. And there's 14 counties. I don't really want to bore you guys reading them all off, but um, we have two residential facilities, uh, one in Burlington that's male only, and then one in Ottumwa that is uh, male and female. Um, so our reentry coordinator at this point, it's just me. We are in the process of hopefully getting another one in the Burlington area. Um, we do prison reach-ins to try to assist with transition planning. Um, we It kind of hits and misses. We'll have quite a few and then not very many. So anytime you have a case that you think would benefit from uh, reach-in calls, please let me know. Um, I work really closely with our POs to be kind of a broker of resources and information for their cases. Um, I also work very closely with our community partners to help with community education and to identify and overcome any barriers that we might be having with our mutual clients. Um, I'm part of a group. It's it's called the uh, Wapalo County Human Resources and Healthy Communities Group, and that's it's it's kind of nice because we can all come together as kind of the the resource hub in our community. Um, we can talk about barriers that we're seeing or resources that we know about. If we have a question, we can email that group, and that's just been kind of helpful. Um, <clears throat> some of the in-house interventions that we do, we have mental health court on the Ottumwa side of the district. We have a drug court in the Burlington side and one in the Ottumwa side, so we call it 8A and 8B. Um, we have our sex offender treatment program. We do IDAP or active classes, and we also are doing um, MRT in the community. Um, and then partnerships, I think that was the big thing that um, when I was asked to present was to really try to highlight some of our partnerships. So um, we're continuing to try to revive them post COVID. I know I'm the only one that said that word so far, <laughs> but it's it's taken a while to get back to that point. Um, we have a great partnership right now with Indian Hills Community College, which is based in Ottumwa. Um, one of the things that we've been working on is we have a high set instructor that comes on site to the Ottumwa facility, and he's here every Thursday morning. Um, he just he meshes so well with our clients. It's awesome. It's not just for the residents of the facility. We also have our um, field service clients will come in and uh, do the classes as well. We celebrated our first two graduates um, last month. So we were pretty excited about that. We actually um, had a little get together with some cookies and punch and they got to invite their families in to celebrate them. So that was fun. Um, let's see, we have um, a partnership with the college also where we are doing a welding program. And we've also done a certified production technician where um, we work with the college and they braid different funds with the gap and pace. And then we also work with WIOA with the Iowa Works to have the funding available to pay for the tuition and supplies for these clients to do the welding program. We just started, I think it's been our, I think it's our fourth or our fifth round just started on the 10th of April. So we've got, I think five clients going through that right now. Um, as far as mental health partnerships, we have Southern Iowa Mental Health Center um, and I work very closely with their integrated health home. I, once a month we get together and they have what's called a team huddle and they invite me in and we talk about our mutual clients. Um, and then we also offer them to come on site to the residential facility to do any intakes or meetings with their clients if need be. Sometimes um, just getting clients to meet with their HH worker can be a problem. So we're trying to break down that barrier. Um, we also work with the mental health center for, we have an ACT program, the assertive community treatment. So that's a very intense wraparound service, which has been helpful for our clients. They also have an access center and a crisis unit. Um, lots of phone calls back and forth with them. It's no wrong door. If you've got somebody that has some mental health needs, we just call down there and they, they help us figure it out. It's wonderful. Um, we also work very closely with our mental health disability regions. Um, the way the map is where we're located, we actually have two mental health disability regions. So just trying to understand um, each region is just slightly different. Um, and what they can help with, but both of them will help with gap funding. Um, they have jail diversion, so they have individuals in the jails. So we try to talk about mutual clients, um, transitioning them back out of the jail, open communication there. Um, they have housing first and permanent supported housing programs that we um, work with them on trying to get wraparound services for clients that are qualified while they're applying for disability benefits. 
We also work closely with uh, River Hills Community Health Center. They have um, outreach and enrollment coordinators on site. <clears throat> Excuse me. What's really handy about them is you don't have to be a River Hills client, but you can go down there and they will help you understand um, what options you have for health insurance. So if they need to re-enroll in Medicaid, if they need to call down and change their incarceration status to go from limited benefits to full coverage, if they um, just got a job and now they're not eligible for Medicaid, they'll help them understand the marketplace or what other options they might have for health insurance coverage. Um, and then we do partner with uh, SafeNet Pharmacy. They've been awesome. Anytime I have any questions, I uh, go ahead and I will call them. They will help us get it figured out and get, get clients hooked up with their medications, either no cost or low cost on their meds. Um, let's see, substance abuse. We work with CETA Community Action, uh, First Resources, and First Resources has two um, inpatient. They have Oak Meadow, which is a uh, co-ed facility, and then they have Hope House, which is a parent and child. I do believe they still have at least one or two beds for a father and child, and then the rest of it is mother and their children. Um, and then in the Burlington area, there's ads. We also have um, an Oxford house in Ottumwa, and that would be like a three-quarter sober living home for men. We Unfortunately, we had a women's one as well, but it has closed. Um, it's only, I think it only houses four or five guys. So it's a very small, but wonderful resource that we have. Um, for employment, we have um, vocational rehabilitation. I am constantly talking with them. They come on site if need be to meet with clients. Um, and then we have very open communication with them. We always get release assigned, make sure we're on the same page. Um, I am working with Iowa Works right now to get uh, an offender workforce development specialist trained career planner to come back on site to do workshops here at the facility. Um, it's nice to be able to send the clients out in the community to go to these workshops. Sometimes they might not be ready or transportation from our facility to where the workforce is can be an issue. So again, we're trying to help break down some of the barriers and increase that communication and partnership with them. Um, I've done uh, presentations for their ECI and employer events before, again, trying to help educate employers on um, hiring our clientele. Um, we have employers come to the facility and do in-house interviews and have rideshare options. We have, we have several employers from, since we're so rural, we have them from all over the place. We have one in Sigourney, Albia, Sheridan, Victor, Iowa, um, Milton, Iowa, which is Van Buren County, and then JBS here in town. Um, and I'm sure I'm missing some things. Um, volunteer opportunities. We work really closely with our Humane Society that's very close to the facility. They welcome anybody to come out there and help, and it's such a win-win. Um, sometimes it can be therapeutic for our clients to help the animals, and they definitely need help. Um, we have a soup kitchen that um, clients can volunteer at, and they can also go there to you have a hot meal. There are several churches in town that will work with us to do volunteer opportunities. And then we are working on um, bringing back some support groups here to the facility. We have a 24-7 dads that has been back for almost a year now. And then we're going to start a women's circle uh, with our crisis center. I think they start in about a month. They'll be coming back to the facility to offer that. And that's open to the public. So anybody can come to those. Um, and then I have a partnership with a local consignment store. I don't give out the name because then everybody will try to go there and get free clothes. <laughs> but I have a partnership that they can help people that are in need for clothing donations. Um, and housing is very limited in the 8th district. Um, when I do have somebody that's looking for that they're either homeless or they're at risk of being homeless, I will refer them to the Rolling Hills Coalition. Um, if they're um, a victim of a domestic violence situation, I can refer them to our Family Crisis Center. They sometimes are able to help with housing options. We do not have any homeless shelters down here. So typically they'll end up in Des Moines. Um, and then we have um, open communication with uh, the owner of one of our long stay motels. And um, there's a handful of landlords that are very open to second chances. And I, I talk quite a bit back and forth with them trying to help if they have any openings for people to find housing, but it's it's kind of tough, but we get creative and try to do what we can. So that's about it in a nutshell. 
Lindsay. Thank, thank you, you, Lindsay. That was awesome. Um, we do have a question. Does voc rehab cover tuition for the vocational training? We have had some in the partnership with the Indian Hills Welding Program that if they qualify for voc rehab, that voc rehab will also help out. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, thank you for that question. And just in case you you all didn't know, um, the uh, voc rehab will now be going over um, with Iowa Workforce Development, as will adult basic education. And so in our realm of education and vocational and registered apprenticeship, um, we see that as, as a great uh, opportunity for people that are incarcerated, you know, that may be involved um, or could be involved with voc rehab. So we're excited to see how those next steps, what they look like and our involvement with those. Lindsay, thank you again so much. I did place the district representatives that presented today for your information. If you have any questions for them or in their district, um, so feel free to reach out to them. I also included information on SafeNet RX um, for medication assistance. And I saw that Jacqueline was with us earlier today, but I do not believe she is with us at the moment. So, um, but if you have any questions uh, regarding their program, uh, please read out, reach out to Jacqueline. Nope, I don't see her on the list right now. So um, if there are no other questions, and John Mathis, thank you for that question. That was a great question. Um, our judicial districts are amazing, first of all. Um, staff are committed. They live within the communities of the people that they serve. And so um, our whole system of corrections is amazing. And again, as I mentioned earlier this morning, we really are human services, even though the title is corrections. But we could not be as successful as we are, especially with our recidivism reduction, without everyone that is with us today and hopefully tomorrow in our reentry conference. We absolutely cannot do this alone. Um, and we absolutely want people to be successful in their real environments. Prison and residential facilities are not real environments. So on behalf of corrections, I thank everyone who presented and I thank everyone who is with us today. And I think that wraps it up for us. And I wasn't sure if Mary or Randy were going to do any closing remarks. You know I can keep talking. No, I think you did great. So um, to close up today and then tomorrow we start again at 9 a.m. Um, so just use the same Zoom link um, to get on and we will see you here. Thank you so much for coming today.